Hi, Pastor Jim Rose here from the North Buffalo Grace Brethren Church in Catanning, Pennsylvania. I want to thank you for tuning in. You know, it truly is a wonderful thing to be part of the family of God. And I trust that you're doing well with your family and your homes in this quarantine. And I pray that God will continue to bless you, provide for you, and encourage your heart. Well, today we're going to be looking at John 14, verses 1 through 6. And I've titled this message, Comfort for Troubled Hearts. On the night before his death, the Lord Jesus Christ addressed the 11 remaining disciples because at this time uh, Judas had left the room there. They were in the upper room. And though the cross with its sin bearing and separation from the Father was soon to take place, Jesus really wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about his disciples. Uh, those, those, their world would be shattered soon, and he cared about them. They were already hurting, confused, and anxious because of the impending loss of their beloved master. Soon he would be gone, and they would weep and lament. Well, you know, because of his perfect and complete love for his disciples, Jesus sought to comfort them in the face of his departure. The verses here in John chapter 14 lay the foundation for that comfort not only for the disciples gathered there in the upper room, but also for all of us as believers. In studying verses 1 through 6 in chapter 14, we see that comfort comes through trusting Jesus Christ's presence, his preparation, and his proclamation. Well, in verse 1, we see that comfort comes from Jesus, trusting Jesus Christ's presence. Look what he says in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, when Jesus told the disciples, let not your heart be troubled, he was not telling them not to start being troubled. They had already, they already were troubled. And he was telling them to stop being troubled. That word troubled there means to, to shake or to stir, stir up. It is used to describe the literally stirring up of the pool of Bethsaida in chapter 5 or 7, and figuratively of severe mental or spiritual agitation. Well, as always, Jesus knew the disciples' hearts. He understood their confusion and concerns. He sympathized with their sorrow and grief. The Lord Jesus then added a second commandment. He said, just as the disciples believe in God the Father, they are to believe also in him. Jesus Christ was affirming his equality with God the Father. He was affirming his deity and placing himself on a par with the Father as an appropriate object of faith. Yes, only God can do that. In reminding them of their hope and trust in God, Jesus was calling his disciples to put their hope and trust in him. We can put our trust in Jesus. Why? Because he is our Lord our God, our Savior, our substitute, our propitiation, our mediator, our advocate, our intercessor, and you could go on and on, but he is our all and all, and we can trust him with all of our heart. The Lord was not calling his disciples to believe savingly in him. They had already done that. The present tense of the verb here that verb, bestuo, it, it believe, it refers instead to an ongoing trust in him, in, in Jesus. Though they genuinely believed in Jesus, the disciples' faith was already beginning to waver. Jesus wanted disciples to know that he, they did not need to physically see him all the time in order to receive comfort and strength from him. Though he would no longer be visibly present with the disciples, Jesus' promise of I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you, would still hold true. Jesus here is referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to make believers aware of his comforting presence. Later in this chapter, Jesus promised, he says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter, that he may abide with you forever, that is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus says. I will come to you. 
So the presence of Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit is enough to calm the believing heart in whatever perplexing or troubling situation we might find ourselves in. A man by the name of John Owen once said, quote, he says, a sense of God's presence in love is sufficient to rebuke all anxiety and fears, and not only so, but to give in the midst of them solid consolation and joy, unquote. And I say amen. In verses 2 and 3, we learn that comfort comes from trusting Christ's preparation. Jesus declared first in verse 2 by saying, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, you see, Jesus wanted to comfort the disciples' heart by revealing that their separation from him would not be permanent and that he was going away to prepare a place for them. The phrase, my father's house, is another name for heaven, which is variously described in scripture as a country in Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, uh, due to its vastness, and then it's described as a city in Hebrews 12, 22, emphasizing its large number of inhabitants, and then it's also described as a kingdom in 2 Timothy 4.18, because God is its king. And then it's described as a paradise in Luke 23.24, uh, and that is because of its indescribable beauty. And last, a place of rest, where the redeemed are free from conflict with sin and Satan and the evil world system that hates those who love Christ. Let's think about those that word mansion. The term mansion means to remain or dwell and refers to a habitation or abode or a dwelling place. Dr. John MacArthur gives us some insight on these, this word mansions here or dwelling places. He says, quote, the dwelling places of which the Lord spoke must not be pictured as separate buildings as if heaven were a giant housing tract. The picture is rather of a father building additional rooms onto his house for his sons and their families, as was often done in Israel. In modern terms, the dwelling places might be pictured as some as rooms or apartments in the father's spacious house. The emphasis is on heaven's intimacy here, where in one Revelation 21, 3, it says, The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. That there will be many such dwelling places means that there will be room for all whom God, in his infinite love and mercy, has chosen to redeem. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for choosing us, selecting us, redeeming us, especially from the eternal hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, let's think about, let's think about heaven. Let's think about that city uh, that the Bible describes. Well, according to Revelation 21, 16, the city, the New Jerusalem, is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, and it was around 1,500 miles 1,500 miles, can you imagine that square? Its length and width and height are equal, so it is probably a cube. In terms of modern measurements, the base of the city alone is over 2 million square miles. Can you imagine a city that big? More than half the size of the United States. The construction of the city wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones like rubies and sapphires and so on. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, 
there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means, by no means, enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life shall be there. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on each other side, of the river was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp uh, for, or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever with the Lord. Wow, can you imagine that? A city that is so vast, so big, and so brilliant, so beautiful. And folks, that's where Jesus went. He went to prepare a place for us, and he's coming again. But not only that, listen to what Revelation 21, 4 says. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow or crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Praise the Lord. You see, heaven is going to be more beautiful than we can imagine, and it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. Jesus' words, if it were not so, I would have told you, assured the disciples that he was telling them the truth. He was going away in part to prepare a place for them where they would be reunited with him in his heavenly glory. One day soon, folks, we will be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever. And I'm looking forward to that. How about you? Well, in verse 3, Jesus continues to comfort his disciples through words of preparation and his returning to them. He declares, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These wonderful words, words from our Savior refers to the rapture of the church. Yes, Jesus Christ is coming back soon to take his bride, the church, away to be with him forever and ever. The absence of any reference to judgment indicates that the Lord was not referring here to his second coming to the earth to judge and establish his kingdom, but rather to the catching up of the believers, his saints, into heaven. You see, the rapture of the church could happen at any moment. Yes, the Bible it speaks of imminent coming of Christ. It could happen. It's over, laying over heads or hanging over heads, ready to happen at any time. It could be today that Jesus returns for his bride. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Absolutely, these words are very comforting to us. The words caught up here uh, in the Greek, it's a, it's a Greek word, harparzo. And it means to snatch away, literally to seize upon with force. We get our English word harpoon from this Greek word. And we all knew, know what harpoons were used for, to, to throw out and to get uh, whales and seize them and bring them back in. And this word also is translated into Latin as rapto, from which we get the English word rapture. The wonderful fa fact that soon... We are going to be raptured away to be with our Lord forever should bring great comfort to our hearts, even if we're going through 
difficult circumstances, we can think about this and be comforted in our hearts, knowing that uh, we, uh, soon, maybe today, Jesus is coming back for us. And I say, even so, come Lord Jesus. In verses 4 through 6, we see that comfort comes from trusting Christ's proclamation. Jesus declares, verse 4, And where I go you know, and the way you know. What well, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Since Jesus had already told them that he was returning to his Father, he expected that the disciples, that they knew where he was going. But by this time, their minds were so rattled that they were not even thinking straight. Thomas speaks up here and shares the disciples' confusion. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Well, the Lord uh, responded to him, and, and so he, he said to them that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, by now the disciples more than likely understood that Jesus was going to die. But their knowledge stopped at death. See, they didn't understand. It didn't make sense to them what was going to happen to Jesus after he died. They had no firsthand experience of what lay, lay beyond the grave. Furthermore, Jesus himself had told them that at this time they could not go where he was going. If they did not know where the Lord was, then how could they know where he was going? So Jesus made it clear to them that he was the way. Well, this lovingly verse makes it clear that the Lord Jesus Christ is himself the way to heaven. He does not merely show us the way. He is the way. Salvation is in a person. Accept that person as your own by grace through faith, and you have salvation. You see, Christianity is Christ. The Lord Jesus not only is he is not just one of many he is the only way no one comes to the father except through him the way to god or heaven is not the ten commandments the golden rule ordinances paying your tithes or even church membership it is through a saving relationship relationship with jesus christ and christ alone Today, many say that it does not matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Well, you know what? You can be sincerely wrong. They also say that all religions uh, have good in them and that they all lead to heaven at last. Well, but the creator of the universe, the only one who died for the sins of the world, Jesus Christ, this is what he says. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way, folks to get to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You see, there are going to be times in our life when we're going to be going through a severe or a troubling circumstances, just like right now with this coronavirus, this COVID-19 that is affecting the whole world, and it's changed our life, and I think it's going to change our lives on into the future. It's going to, things are going to be different. But that's okay. Jesus has not changed. He's always the same, and we can trust in him. See, he is enough for every situation that we find ourselves in. You see, what we need to do is simply look to him and trust in him with all of our heart, and he will be there. You see, comfort for troubled hearts comes when we put our complete trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and for all that we need each and every day of our life. Jesus Christ, folks, he is enough for everything. He's more than enough. I pray that you'll put your trust in him, first of all, for salvation, and then that you will continue to trust him with all that you need. He'll never, ever fail you. He cannot. So I praise God for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God help you and bless you in these times, troubling times, that he will give you peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because you trust in you. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Lord, how that you was giving the disciples comfort. Lord, how that you can comfort our hearts in troubling times. Lord, I pray that you would help us that, Lord, that instead of focusing on our problems, on our circumstances, on our troubles, we will focus on the one who controls all things and has the answers to all problems, and that is you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to keep our, our eyes fixed up on you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us through each and every day, that Lord, that would bring glory to you as we uh, completely surrender our will over to your will. Lord, I pray that you bless all of our brothers and sisters out there, encourage their hearts and strengthen them, supply their needs, Lord, and keep them safe. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name, and amen. God bless you.